verses 1 through 11. I'll be speaking to you this morning on the mind of Christ. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking good today. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask you, Lord, to... Use me in the next few minutes to communicate clearly what you're saying here. And Lord, I pray that you, by your spirit, would supersede my attempt and that you would speak to every heart how this word applies to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 begins with the words, therefore. Therefore. When you see the word therefore, it's referring, it's a conjunction referring to the previous statement. So if you see the word therefore, stop and see what it's there for and read the previous statement. Verse 29 of chapter 1, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Therefore, if there is any consolation. Notice he said that it was granted to them to be able to believe in Jesus. You know, that is a gift from God. By grace are we saved through faith, and that faith is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Saving faith is a gift. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something we conjure up. The Spirit creates it. And faith is a result of hearing God speak to you. Faith, Romans chapter 10, comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing, and we can't hear unless God gives us the ability to hear. And hearing comes from the Word of God. So when God speaks to us, we hear it. Our hearing uh, is a gift from Him as well, and we believe that Word and faith is born. Faith is also a gift of the Spirit. It's not something we conjure up, but it is something we exercise. He's given you faith. Step out on it. You can trust His Word. Amen? But also, not only have we been granted to be given saving faith, it's also been granted to us, according to Philippians 1.29, to suffer for Him, to experience persecution, to experience resistance in the world. We spoke on this last week, uh, well, the last time I spoke. On the bright sides of suffering for Jesus, here's some of them. Uh, When we suffer for Jesus, we truly know we are going against the flow of the world. Sometimes confirmation comes in the form of opposition. Who knows that's true? We are following Jesus' example when we suffer patiently. He suffered so that we could be blessed, but he also suffered as an example. Peter said that he left us an example by suffering so that we could walk in his steps. And how did he suffer? He suffered persecution. And it's not been guaranteed that we will ever escape that, per se, in this life in the world. We also receive an opportunity to deny self and follow Jesus. You know, if it was convenient to follow Jesus, how would we ever become like Jesus? Because you can't be like Jesus and be you at the same time. The hippie said, I'm trying to find myself, and when I do, that's who I'm going to be. Uh, We need to try to find Jesus 
And as we search for him, he conforms us to his image. And as we deny self, persecution helps us to deny self because I want to give the old man giving me trouble for my Christianity lockjaw, but I deny self. And it makes us more like Christ. We are made stronger when we go through tribulation. It's the truth. It's the truth. We have evidence that we are truly involved in his cause. What do you expect? We are honored to suffer for the one we love. Um, Nothing communicates love any better than persistence, perseverance, and endurance to stick it out for the sake of the one that you love. It communicates that. And so it's an honor to do the same for Jesus. The early disciples rejoice that we are worthy to suffer for his name. And we will be rewarded in this life and the life to come. A hundredfold is what it says. Amen. So, Paul goes on to say there in verse 30, having the same conflict which you saw in me when he started this church in Acts 16, 11 years earlier, he was thrown in prison, he was beaten, he got a miraculous deliverance. Now they hear he's back in prison and there is no earthquake, there is no deliverance, he's just there. Writing stuff. And so they saw that kind of stuff happening to him. And now they hear it is happening to him. And to them, the same thing has been granted. You know, we've never been promised a rose garden. And if we were, roses got thorns, don't they? Right? All right. Moving on. I don't like to preach on suffering, but it's the truth. We get to know him more intimately. Paul goes on in Philippians to say that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Oh, yes, I love that. And in the fellowship of his sufferings. Amen. All right. Now to our text. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, he's making a statement because there is consolation in Christ. There is comfort of love. There is fellowship in in the Spirit. There is affection and mercy. And on the basis of that, he's saying, if these things are true, fulfill my joy by walking in the same thing. Being of one accord, having the same love, being of one mind. If there's any consolation in Christ, this word consolation in the Greek means exhortation, which which edifies us. It calls us higher. Is there edification? Is there encouragement in Jesus? If there's any comfort of love, this word of love is agape. This is who God is. God is love. Is there any comfort in his love? Any fellowship in the Spirit. It's just wonderful to worship the Lord together, experience His presence together. This is fellowship of the Spirit we have here today. Is there any affection and mercy? Does God show that to us? I mean, we should have been destroyed years ago. But He's given us mercy. Amen? He's given me what I don't deserve, and He has not given me what I do deserve. This is a wonderful thing. And if it is true, then let's start thinking the same way, being like-minded. Some people run around confessing, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I think the thoughts of God. I have the mind of Christ. As though they're going to have a higher IQ by doing that. It's not intelligence. It's attitude. It's Christ-likeness. Thinking like he thought. It's not the cerebral cortex that dwelt in his skull that we're going to get a piece of. It is Jesus' spirit, his attitude, his lifestyle, his way of thinking that our minds are being renewed to day by day. And so if there's any goodness that God has for us, let's share that with others. It's like take and give. Take and give. Receive and disperse. Give it away. Give away what he gives you. Has he shown you mercy? 
Show somebody else mercy. Has he shown you affection? Spread the love around. Amen. That's what he's saying. Verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Now this goes contrary to the way the world thinks. Our culture is all about competition and pride. In fact, at pep pep rallies, we will brag about our pride. Um, And it's possible to see that in church. If you don't believe it, just go to YouTube and Google, I'm a Pentecostal. And there's a song on there where this whole church is bragging about who they are. Just bragging. It's not who we are. It's who he is. Amen. Amen. It's who he is. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. There's some people out to climb the ladder of the church or of the corporate world. And it's fine to do that if you have a heart to serve and to communicate God's love in in uh, greater spheres in your life as God promotes you. But it's a whole other thing to be promoted, to, to be competitive. Um, I better hush right there. All right. Verse 4, Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. You know, Paul told the Corinthians to not compare themselves among themselves because those who do are not wise. When we compare ourselves with others and keep score, we're going to be inclined to pride or jealousy just or envy. It's just going to be that way. We're going to wind up depressed or prideful. And pride comes before a fall. And so if we esteem everyone better than ourself, well, then it's a joy to serve one another because... Well, that's my sister. She's the daughter of a king. That's my brother. He's a prince of a guy. He's better than me. What can I do to bless him? What can I learn from him? This will enhance fellowship in any church. It's good. Good. This means our children are worthy of our respect. Our grandchildren are worthy of our respect. Our grandparents are worthy of our respect. It's a culture of honor what the church is to be about. What happens when we function like this? People rise up to the occasion and begin to live out the greatness that God has put in them. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, he says, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. If you give a cup of water to a little one in the name of a disciple, you'll by no means lose your reward. What is he talking about? Here's what I think he's talking about. If, if a person is gifted as a prophet or a person is a righteous person and we receive them for who God has made them, they will be able to be who God has made them in our life. And we'll reap the benefits of it. If we don't receive them, we won't reap the benefits of it. Jesus experienced this when he went back to his hometown, read Isaiah 61, and said, I'm the fulfillment of this, and they ran him out of town. The Bible says he did no mighty work there. He could only heal heal a few sick people. He did not function in the greatness that God had placed upon him because they wouldn't receive him for who he was. Could this be why... uh, Some Christians are weak and anemic because no one's received them for who God has called them to be. Have you ever gone to a family reunion where everybody relates to you through your past and they don't take anything you say seriously because they changed your diapers or they remember the car you wrecked when you were a teenager 
and you're not able, but yet you've got friends that receive you for who you are, and it's sad. Your cousins don't know that you got it going on. <laughs> anyway, so if, if we're a church that esteems others better than ourselves, then we'll be a church where it's, it will be easy for people to flow in their gifting, to serve in the capacity with which God has called them. All right. Good. Let's move on then. I'm an exhorter. I'll get on one point and hammer it to death. So, all right, pastor, I got the point. <laughs> well, the, the, Paul's going to hammer it here. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Are you ready for this? Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now that's kind of an unusual statement. One translation says, he did not think of equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now remember, he is God. John had this revelation in chapter 1 of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. In his first letter, he says, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. So he is God. It was not something he had to work at. It is who he was. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. I tell you what he was grasping at was equality with man. This is descending to our level. He was after that to the point of making himself of no reputation. You know, he was accused his whole life of being a bastard made himself, took that position. And as a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross, of the cross. This is condescension coming down. Look at this. The ultimate condescension. The king of glory became a man. As a man, Jesus came as a Jew, not the most loved people group on the earth. You see that? As a Jew, he came as a baby, born with his legitimacy in question. From heaven, he came to Bethlehem, a little one-horse town, and lived in Nazareth, which is like a one-goat town <laughs> in Mexico. I mean, it's, it is a poor village. Even to this day, it's not a great place. When I toured Israel, that's the place that, that impacted me the most was the humility of Jesus coming to live in that place. I, I couldn't get over it. There were shrines everywhere, all kinds of sites, but I was just crying about Nazareth. <laughs> From Nazareth, he became a carpenter without power tools. And I've been to Nazareth. There's not a lot of wood there. So what did he work with? Well, the Greek word for carpenter also means stonemason, which is an amazing thing. He, he is the stone made without hands. He is the stone that the builders rejected as is made the chief cornerstone. He is the rock upon which the church is built. And there's mangers over there that are made out of stone. Could it be that the stone from heaven that came out of the mountain, made without hands, that, that Daniel prophesied about, was laid in a stone manger? I don't know. Just an incredible thing. The synagogue there is made completely out of stone. Even the roof, just a big stone dome. Jesus worked with stone. And we are living stones, being shaped and formed into a spiritual house, Peter said. So he knows what he's doing spiritually and physically. This is hard work. And as a carpenter, he became a servant. One thing to be a carpenter and have your own company. Another thing to 
be a servant. And as a servant, he was falsely accused of being a criminal. Do you see the descending? Jesus Christ becoming a man is like, and it's not even like this, but this would be similar just for the sake of illustration. One of us becoming an ant and going to the ants to bring life to the ants. A lower species of being. God became man. One preacher said, it's like us becoming a cockroach. That didn't sound real respectful, but. As an accused criminal, he was cruelly tortured. The dissension is just amazing. He died an unjust death, reserved for the world of criminals. And as a dead man, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But hallelujah, he didn't stay there. He led captivity captive. And as a dead and buried, falsely accused Jewish servant man, he made the ultimate comeback and reveals to all who he really is. He came down so that we could come up. We were already down. He came down to our level. He came lower than our level. You know, if you've got something uh, stuck in the mud... To get it out of the mud, sometimes you've got to get a shovel and go lower than the object is you're trying to get. Otherwise, you might damage it and pull it up. He came lower than we were to come below us to lift us up. He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Aren't you glad about it? Therefore, because he has done this, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Now... Look back at the text. Well, I don't want to do that. We get lost in the dissension and lose the message. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, take the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross humbled himself context here he's talking about esteeming one another as highly now he's talking about humbling himself oh but I don't want to work in children's ministry that's below me let this mind be in you sorry I just had to throw that in there was just too easy Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We want the mind of Christ, amen? And it it is a humble way of thinking. Coming lower, thinking of yourself as lower. This is not not, um, inferiority. This is um, humility. Humility is to resist pride and to humble ourselves. And you know, saints, we're going to be humble anyway, because we're being conformed to the image of Jesus, right? If we don't humble ourselves, we'll be humiliated. So let's don't do that. That's very painful. Let's just humble ourselves, resist that pride, and, and esteem others more highly than ourselves, and follow the example of Jesus, and we'll be blessed in the process. Look at what happened to him. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee, say every knee, should bow. Well, what about things that don't have knees? Well, they'll get knees. Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When John had his vision of heaven, he saw a number that no one could number and there were present in that multitude of people praising God and declaring the Lordship of Christ were people from every tribe Nation and tongue. This word tongue also means language. Every language will declare in their own language that Jesus is Lord.
Those who speak Swahili in Kenya and Tanzania will say, Yesu Christu, Nibwana. In Creole, the Haitians will shout, Jezi Krisi Seyi. In Croatia, the Croatians will bow their knees and confess with their tongues, Isis Chris, Je Gospotten. In Germany, they will say, Jesus Christus is the Herr. In Greece, the Greeks will say, Kyrios Jesus Christos. His name has been translated into every language. You see, he created languages. Some people might get offended if you don't say their name in, in English. But I don't know about you. I've met some people from other countries. I can't pronounce their name in their language. It has to be pronounceable so I can respect them. And so it is, it is a sign of respect to translate a name into a language or transliterate a name into a language where it can be spoken. In Icelandic, they will say, Jesus Christer is Lord. In Italy, the Italians will say, Jesu Christo. In New Zealand, the Maoris will say, Ihu Karatai. I like that. In Romania, the Romanians will say, Isas Christas. And in Spanish, the Spaniards will say, El Señor. And in English, the English speakers of the world will say, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was given his name by inheritance, by promise. And he was given his name by conquest. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. But more so than that, because that wouldn't have happened if he did not conquer his human nature. There was a war going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. And he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, the Bible says. And he won the victory, stood up and said, let's go. He was ready. Bring it. He was ready. He had laid down his will. Where is your will in reference to the will of God? Where is mine? This is the journey we're on as believers, being conformed to his image, following him. Thank God we're going to heaven, but the Christian life is about more than fire insurance. It's about a life of transformation. As we lay down our will, take up our cross and follow him, we decided to follow Jesus. Amen. I want to end the service today with uh, lifting up the name of Jesus. And I've asked Big C to come back up and do one of his numbers, lift up the name of Jesus. You want to come tonight? Uh, Isaac Duke will be here from Crossroads Church. Michelle Winters will be here from uh, Stonewater Church. Uh, Jen Rev will, Jen, Jen Praise will be here and Jen Rev will be here from Generations Church and other artists will be here along with Big C to give the Lord praise, honor, and glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Can we give God a hand? Hallelujah.